Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our sixth lesson in our RBM training series on source data review. And I'm really excited about this one. I can't wait for you guys to hear um, more about um, some of the approaches that we've developed. Um, and with me today, we have two um, of the MANA team, Christine McKee, who was on the program last week talking about central monitoring. Um, she also does site monitoring. And Geraldine Vacpano, who is, uh, does both project management and lead monitoring for us um, at MANA. And they're going to talk to you a little bit about some of the tools that we've developed to help make um, source data review easier and more efficient and, and more comprehensive. So can't wait to get started. Let's go. I'm just making sure I'm recording. Yep. Okay. Um, for those of you that are new, we uh, just give a little bit of introduction that MANA RBM, that we have, our team has been really focused on the principles of both RBM and remote trial management for more than 10 years. Um, my background um, as a physician, I've been a PI and uh, vice president at a major pharma company and also a chief medical officer at two technology companies. Um, and our team has, you know, designed and implemented the entire process for risk-based monitoring for multiple sponsors, um, as well as completing a knowledge transfer um, to a sponsor. Um, and so uh, what we want to do in this is to, what we hear over and over again is that people really want to hear from um, uh, hear how to do this from people who are actually doing it. So they're sick of all the theoretical, they want to get right down and say, okay, how do I make that? How do we make this happen? And that's what this, um, this training program is all about. And in addition to doing RBM, we've also developed with a team um, the competencies for site monitors, um, as well as published on a number of different aspects of risk-based monitoring. Um, and so this program is designed around trying to address the competencies that, that we've identified that are new um, for monitors with risk-based monitoring. Um, just so that you know, our webinars are available <clears throat> on YouTube, but with YouTube, you don't always get um, updates when we up when we add new, um, you know, webinars, etc., or when we add the tapes for the webinars. So, if it the best way to make sure that you're updated all the time is to like us on Facebook as well as on LinkedIn, and then we'll then we'll make sure you get all. Any new training materials that we have, any new white papers, all the new materials that we develop. Um, you can also follow us on um, Google Plus and um, on Twitter. And the other really cool thing is our new website's up, so go visit us. Um, just, a, just a note, um, we were named one of the finalists for the Clinical Informatics Best Practices Award, and this was about the knowledge transfer of the entire um, risk-based monitoring approach to a biotech company, um, and we've just released, um, I'm sorry, this is a little bit late, we have released um, a white paper on what C-level executives need to know about RBM. If you want a copy of that, you can download load that from our website. So the goal of our entire training program is about to help monitors to understand risk-based monitoring, both, both the principles and goals, as well as how to accomplish those goals. And let's see. Um, so the learning objectives for today are um, that the monitor will be able to describe how the site monitor can complete source data review and to describe what tools can enhance source data review. So just as a reminder, <clears throat> with risk-based monitoring, um, the, the, all, both the guidance and some information that's come out from um, uh, organizations such as Transcelerate, um, there is a change from source data verification to a more comprehensive look, which we're calling source data review. And that's what we're talking about today is source data review. So the goals of that are to really make sure that we have the right subject, that they're, you know, that the, the subject meets the criteria, that there's full protocol compliance, that we've looked at safety issues, that we make sure that all the data are there, that all the assessments are there, that all the processes have been followed according to protocol, 
that GCP has been maintained and that we have full, correct and complete documentation. So that's what we're trying to do in our source um, data review process. Now, there's lots of source, sources for source. Um, um, so if you think about the, the definition of source data, that is the first place that, that that information is recorded. So you know that we like to use as much direct data entry as we can, but certain of it, uh, certain of the information you're going to use, depending on your trial, depending on your indication, all of the protocol, some of that information will come elsewhere from things like the medical records or from other electronic systems. So, and some will come from EDC. If you use paper to collect that data, then, then that EDC has to be transcribed and the paper is the source. But if you use direct data entry, then we can, then the data that for the trial that is collected when the subject is visited, if it's entered directly at the time the subject is seen, that is the source. And that's important because as much as we can collect that data from the primary place, then we don't have to worry about things like transcription and we really can get into the real important part of the data. Um, so we also have data that's coming in from things like your diaries, um, more and more of that. Sometimes um, IVR or IWR systems um, will collect data from subjects too, so that's important. And don't forget things like documents. So there's, are there any other places for source data review? Yeah, so your labs would be another source. There could be many, many different sources for source data review. So one of the first places, and we talked a little bit about this last week, is this idea of um, looking at, at the subject's data. So what we wanna do is look at the subjects, the data for that subject, both in the context of the protocol, but an important piece is also in the context of the investigator brochure. So I don't know how many of you um, read the IB, I should have probably put a poll in to ask you that, but the investigator brochure gives a lot of information and we'll go through some of that today. So remember, the information from the medical history will determine whether that's the appropriate subject. Con meds is another piece on the inclusion exclusion, but also AEs, you know, are we getting appropriate reporting there? So let's go back a minute, let's go a minute back to this rectangular review that we talked about because <clears throat> this is a big part of your source data review. This is why by removing that time of doing the point to point or transcription checking, you have time to think about this because this isn't something that you're just saying, checkbox, checkbox. You really have to think about it and look at the data together. And that's what we're, again, what we've been really focusing on is how to make that easier. So remember what you're wanting to do at the beginning of the study is you're gonna wanna look at the medical history. Does that, is that in alignment with what is required for the protocol? You want to look at the prior con, con meds and see whether that whether you those are aligned with the medical history. In fact, do you have a con med for each medical history, or do you have confirmation that there is no treatment? Are some of the con meds used for prophylactic pro purposes? You know, such like a you know the aspirin for a prevention of heart heart attack. So all of these things you want to look at, but then you also want to look at supporting assessments like your labs, your vital signs, your ECG, and do though and whether there's a relation there to the concomitant medications and a relation there to any adverse events. So let's let's go in a little bit and look at an example. So <clears throat> this is a phase three trial for um, type two diabetes. So we know that the subject, um, and I think if I do a click, we have some, so let's look at what we would do from a screening visit review as part of source data review. And remember, the reason we're going through this is when you remove SDV, this is what you should be spending your time with. This is the important stuff, and this is going to what the principles are for SDV. So was the informed consent signed prior to performing any assessments? That's why we like to do remote informed consent review. Are there meds for all the diagnoses or is it documented that the condition is controlled without meds? So let's start there. And is there a corresponding condition for every either surgical procedure or con meds? And, um, and are there any diagnosis contraindicated for the protocol? So if we look at this and we have a subject, this is a type three study for type two, a phase three study for type two diabetes. And you can see that this subject is taking insulin and metformin You'd expect that. Those are both treatments 
for, um, for diabetes. The patient has a history of diabetes for 15 years. They're also on aspirin. You would expect that. Um, you, when you see that, the way the aspirin should be reported is as prophylaxis for something such as um, a heart attack. And you would also not be surprised about that because patients with diabetes have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And they're also on a multivitamin. So that looks fine. So those really seem to align, okay? What we want to also think about, so all of these that are in white are things that we can look at remotely in the CRF and, and answer these questions. The ones in yellow are things that you do need to make a check in your medical records. So part of um, risk-based monitoring is you do not have to check every subject's inclusion exclusion criteria, but you need to have a plan of how you're going to check it or wh who's going to check it. Now, if you're doing study like a vaccine study, that may not be important, but if you're doing a study like this where you have to have a certain um, diagnosis for a certain period of time, you need to make sure that they may be on medication for a certain period of time. Some of that, the only place you're going to get that data is in the medical record. So you do need to recognize that, that some of these fields, some of this information, even if you do most of your study remotely, there are things that you will need to check. So you can't usually completely eliminate on-site visits, although there are ways that you can bring these in as certified electronic sources we've talked about as well. So there are different ways that you can do this, just like we talked about with risk-based monitoring. There are different processes you can adopt, and it really kind of depends on the study. So now let's go and look at this for when the study is ongoing. Okay, so it looks a little bit different. You can see that more meds have been ad added, so we have lisinopril added, and so that you, because you may not be able to pop in and look at um, Google to look this up or look at Wikipedia, but this, this is a drug used to treat blood pressure, but also used to treat um, both eye diseases um, and neuropathy in, in, um, in, in subjects with diabetes. And lamotrigine, and lamotrigine is a, a, a drug used to treat epilepsy, okay? So now you're looking at these meds, and you're looking, let's look at these. So this is as the study is going on, and you're looking at these di um, medical histories. So now there's asthma in there. And there's a panretinal photocoagulation. So this is a retinopathy. So this is a, a, a known uh, complication, but that, remember, the subject actually didn't have this. So should this really be here or should this be down here? So if this wasn't reported at the time the study started, you'll want to look at when, that start, when the onset of this photocoagulation was and see whether this, in fact, should be an AE as opposed to a conmed, as, as opposed to a medical history. So this is part of that rectangular review and checking dates and making sure that you can identify this. Again, with the lab of a hemoglobin A1C increased, that's telling you that the diabetes has gotten worse. So when you see this in your labs, and remember we're doing that rectangular review, this is saying, oh, now I need to expect to see something like worsening of diabetes as an adverse event. When you're seeing lipids increased, then this could also be worsening of diabetes or it could be some other cardiovascular disease. And you also see retinopathy worsened, which is why you saw this panretinal um, photocoagulation. But if you look at the AEs down here, it says development of neuropathy. So where would you expect to see um, this identified, and you would expect to see something like your neuropathy identified in your physical exam. So you might not see that here, but you would expect to see that in your physical exam, your history and physical. So sometimes you'll see that just in a history of, um, you know, pins and needles um, in, in, a, in a patient's feet, um, so some kind of pain. So that's why you really need to look at these to make sure that they all match. So the fact that you have lamotrigine here, you would want to raise a query and ask about whether they either have bipolar disease or whether they have um, epilepsy. And those are the two indications for lamotrigine. When you're seeing um, the photocoagulation here, you're going to want to look at those dates and you're going to want to say, when did that rally occur? Is that really a med history or is that an AE? And this asthma, 
hmm, so now asthma is on there. Is it a medical history? You need to look at when it was treated. And what's the question you want to ask there is, okay, is there a treatment for that, for that um, asthma that should be over here? And again, you'll want to query that to see whether there is a treatment for the asthma. Usually there's some kind, even if it's a, a PRN, um, um, some kind of inhaler, they usually have some kind of a treatment. So these, when you see these written out like this, it helps you to begin to see where you need to raise your queries. So if you have a, a diagnosis here, does it belong here or here, depending on the dates? Do you have a, a con med that goes along with it? When you same way here, if you see this, is this in fact a, a med history or an AE? The same way here, what is the documentation that you have here? So looking at this as this rectangular review, however you do it, is really going to help you to identify where there are missing things. So what else do you want to look at in your source data review? Like we said, we want to look at the labs. Are there any lab changes to be expected? Are there any new medications? Were the lab values designated as clinically significant? And we're going to go into labs a little bit more so that you can get a little more detail. And are there any findings that are ind indicative of an AE? Um, as well as are there any protocol deviations? So this is the kind of, this is what you are going to be doing as part of your source data review. Now you could say, hey, that's easy for you, Penny. You're an MD. But with Google, you can go in and look up what is lisinopril? What is it used to treat? What is lamotrigine? What is it used to treat? So it used to be very difficult to get this. Now it's quick as, quick as can be. So you can, whenever you see something like this come in, you can look at what you would expect the treatments to be and ask if they're on any of those. So this is why by getting rid of SDV, you have the time now to do this kind of careful review. Now, one of the things that we want to emphasize here is that you can't just look at the protocol review. You really have to look at the investigator brochure as well, um, because what you're wanting to do is you're going to want to have an index of sp suspicion about certain adverse events. So you want to know what adverse events were there from the previous study, and that should be in both the protocol and the IB. But are there other adverse events that are common for this specific class of drugs? So those of you that do trials in depression, you often know that like there's a box warning now around um, around suicide. So if you're saying, oh, if I'm if it's an adolescent trial with an antidepressant, do I need to have an index of suspicion for that? If it's a um, for some of the, um, you know, the. Um, my brain, the, work, the drugs that are used to treat diabetes and they now have some cardiovascular effects, do I want to think about that? So you're wanting to think not just about what's there for a specific drug, but what do you see in that class of drugs? You want to understand the mechanism of action of that drug. How is it working? Because that will affect um, what you might see for adverse events. And are there any AEs of interest that are covered in both the protocol and investigator brochure? So if you're in a phase three trial, you may already have identified areas of interest. And for, for uh, one of the um, programs I worked in, we, were, we wanted to know everything we could about skin reactions. So it depends on the program. And again, this will probably be independent of how the mechanism of the drug is, maybe or maybe not. But you want to really understand all of this aspect of adverse events before you start monitoring. Now, I thought it would be good to kind of go through one area. So we're going to go through in more, a little bit more detail about labs because there's more to labs than just is it clinically significant. So one of the things you want to look at, were the labs done at the correct visit and at the correct times? Were there any assessments missed? And if so, why? So again, if you go back and look at um, things like um, the um, 483s that have been given to investigators, this was one where they missed assessments. So if you're seeing people systematically miss assessments, you need to really understand why that's the case. And that is a big warning sign for you. Were any assessments done that were not indicated in the protocol? Another really important piece. And it depends on the type of study, but, you know, Everything has to go back to doing the study the way the protocol is designed. Um, were labs reviewed by the investigator? And that's why, again, some of the system design is really useful because 
Um, if you have to go to two or three places, it's often easy to miss that. So, um, but you want to make sure that the labs in some way were reviewed by the investigator, whether it's, you know, them signing on a paper lab form, that's okay, but you need to know to check that. And how is that documented? And were abnormal lab um, results given a classification by the PI? So any abnormal lab should be determined to be either clinically si significant or not clinically significant. And then any clinically significant labs by the that were de deemed clinically significant by the PI should be entered as an AE. So that's why you, this is how you why you need to check all these things. And were those clinically significant labs followed to conclusion? So one of the places it's easy to miss is this idea of when did that when did that um, uh, abnormality change, whether it's a lab or an AE or what. So you wanting to you know it's. Oftentimes we can get the start date, but we sometimes forget to look at when it ended. And, you know, flu doesn't last for a year. So you want to make sure that you can pick these things up. So in addition to all of those things, there's more. So one of the things you want to be thinking at is do the labs fit with expected abnormalities based on the IB or the protocol? So regardless of what the investigator says, if, if it is an expected adverse event, even if they say it's not clinically significant, it needs to be entered as an AE. So you cannot just use the clinical significance by the PI. Remember, they're seeing only a little bit of the data. They may be seeing, um, it may be that the subject only had one dose of a medication. It may be that um, it's just the, whatever the adverse event is, is just beginning. And if you remember when we looked at some of the review last week, we talked about um, that sometimes AEs will be non-serious and serious. And so remember, it's a continuum and you want to look at all of that together. And is there a temporal relation to either the study drug or maybe a concurrent illness? So, for instance, viral illnesses can really affect your, your hematology, your, your, your white counts, even your red counts and things like that, even your hemoglobin and hematocrit. So really understanding what these abnormalities are and how they might be related. This is something that you need to take ownership on as well. This is not just for the PI. And another really, again, this was a finding on some of um, the 483s for investigators are, are procedures properly followed for the follow-up of abnormal labs? So that's in the protocol usually, and you need to make sure that those procedures are followed appropriately. So there's a lot to labs besides just saying, oh, the investigator said it wasn't clinically significant. So as I'm just giving you, so I jumped a little bit ahead here. And so if they've marked all of the out of range labs as not clinically significant, are you off the hook? And I've already given you the answer to that. The answer is no, you're not off the hook. Because you need to make sure that all AEs are reported. And that includes questioning any out of range labs, okay? Could they be indicative of an AE? And if, if so, as soon as you see NCS, you're not done yet. Just remember that. Um, because whether it's clinically significant or not, um, it doesn't, that is not the only determination of whether it's an adverse event. So let's look at the ICH guidance on, abnorm, on adverse events. So in ICH E6, they say it's any untoward medical occurrence in a patient or clinical investigational subject administered a pharmaceutical product or which does not necessarily have a causal relation with this treatment. So it, an adverse event can therefore be any unfavorable and unintended sign, including abnormality lab findings, symptoms, or disease temporar temporar temporarily associated with the use of a medicinal product, whether or not related to the medicinal product. So it doesn't matter if it's related. It doesn't matter necessarily whether um, the subject is symptomatic. It's any unintended uh, or unfavorable sign that occurs, whether it's related to the drug. And the reason for that is sometimes you can't necessarily identify whether they're related or not. Um, when uh, early in my career, there was a drug that was released, Felbamate, for epilepsy, and uh, they had um, 
hepatic failure. And the first cases that came in, everybody said, oh, can't be related to the drug. But it wasn't until you got that body of knowledge across all of the treating physicians that you were able to identify that trend. So that's why it's so important. You can't take one physician's view of the few patients that they see and use that as your only indication of whether you have an adverse event. That's why it's so important that you really understand the IB, you really understand um, what drugs are used, and again, class and, and molecule types effects. So the rule of thumb should be that if the abnormality is deemed related to or caused by the investigational product, then it is most definitely an AE. So no question about that. But you can't say the converse. It doesn't mean that the converse is true. So if it doesn't require treatment, it's not an AE. That's not right. So in the de definition of an AE, it's any unfavorable and unattended sign, which is what that lab abnormality is. So remember, you just anytime you see clinically significant you know that's an AE, but the not clinically significant, if it's abnormal, you need to have an index of suspicion. And, and, and it is absolutely reasonable for you to query that, knowing what you do about the ICHE6 guidelines. So what we wanted to do now is because, um, you know, if now that we're moving away from SDV, what we want to be doing now is thinking about how do we do source data review? And as, as uh, my team has told me many times, um, it's, 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 it's difficult, and especially looking at start and stop dates, et cetera. So let's go back through what we need to do. So first is, first, every time, define those high, do your risk analysis and define the high risk data and processes, because those are the ones you're gonna wanna look at first and most carefully. You want, we then develop what we call our sub SPAR or subject profile analyzing risk, which incorporates all the data from the high risk processes as well as safety and IP dosing. And I'm gonna show you that and show that to you in a minute. So from a data standpoint, in your source data review plan, you wanna look at data across all assessments and all visits. And you can do that better with the SPAR and I'll show that to you. On site, you still have to do certain things like check inclusion, exclusion, alignment, any evidence of AEs not reported. So this, the SPAR that I'm going to show you is not the only thing you use, but it is a very good first step. You'll hear us talk about that again. And for instance, if you are using your data collector to document uh, good clinical practice or protocol compliance, then we do things like collect in initials of, of site personnel on key assessments and that way we can check those against the delegation of authority in the ECRF. So these are all things that you do as part of your source data review. In your doc, don't forget documents, so informed consent review and any certified source. So for instance, local labs, or if your PIs were getting their printed lab form and they were entering it on there, then you're gonna wanna look at those in your EISF as well. So as we talked about, what happens now is we're looking at individual fields. We're going to go to a more comprehensive view. And so let's get to that comprehensive view. So if you're not doing SDV, what are you doing and how are you doing it? So let's look at this. So right now what you do is you look at your, for a visit, you look at your vital signs, then you look at your labs, then you look at the ECGs, then you look at your quality of life and your HAMD. Those are all different forms within your ECRF. And you look at each individually, you look at them each individually and separately. Then when you get to visit two, you start doing the same thing. So you look at the vital signs for visit two and the labs and the ECGs, quality of life and HAMD. But the problem is oftentimes you don't have an easy way to look at them across this way, which is one of the ways you really want to look at data. So not only do you want to look at individual data sets, but you want to look at their relation to each other. So that's why we developed what we call the SPAR. So I'm going to walk you through this, and then um, two of my, uh, our team members are going to sh share some real live examples of how they use it and um, more examples. But what we do then is we try to put the high risk data elements together and we try to set them so that they're easier to compare. So for instance, the, my, the medical history will be here. We put the dosing here. 
For this study, there was a diary component on medication, and then the site had to enter the ConMeds into the ConMeds. So by doing this, we could compare what the subject was entering in the diary with what the site was entering in the ConMeds. So again, this was source data because it was entered directly by the subject. So it was really allowed us to identify that. And let me just walk you through. So one thing we did is to put different data sets together so that we could compare them if we needed to. Everything is normalized to what we call relative days. So we talked about that a little bit last week. And this allows you to say, so relative day one is the day that the subjects start taking their dose. So if you scroll, you can scroll to the left and see more from a medical history standpoint. If you scroll to the right, you can see more of the study. But everything, all of the different data sets are normalized. So that way, it's much easier to compare your dates and make sure that things are, are in comparison. So if you look at this one, um, this subject reported migraine as a med history, but they started, they have sumatriptan listed here and on day five, but in, in the ConMeds, it's listed on day eight. So it allows you to quickly see these things and identify where your errors are and raise queries. Then the other thing you want to do is do you want to look at the, the AEs versus the med history? And I'll give you another example of that in a minute so that you can look at that. And then for this study, we were adding additional things from the diary and assessments that the central RN had to make. So when we saw this, we knew that the subject had reported an adverse event, and then we could look at both what they reported on um, changes in their med history and then these specific adverse events that we could look at. So what this does is it takes all of these data sets together. It allows you to put them together based on dates, so it's much easier to find when you have errors in dates. It's much easier for you to compare things like your AEs to your med history, your ConMeds to your AEs to your med history. So, um, and depending on your study, what your other data fields are like. So this is a really useful tool. And as I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not just selling it. I'm going to let I'm going to let Jerry and Christine give you some more examples. Now here's another example just to show you how you would look at this. So this is a little bit different. This is, um, um, but let me just walk you through this. So for this, this study, this subject was taking individual doses on all these different days. You can see they started on relative day one, just the same. Here are your ALT. So this is bringing in lab values. And for this, um, a high value is a red triangle and a low value is a blue triangle. And if they're in the normal range, it's going to be a green square. Okay. Now, and then if you wanted to see the actual values, we, we've shown them here as well. So you can look at the actual values. Um, and so again, these are your liver function tests. This is liver function tests. This is your renal and this is your hematology. And then down here are the comments for this one. Now, what I want you to think about here is if we look at the, the adverse events here, you can see here that um, we have anemia listed. So anemia is listed as an adverse event that started when that subject started dosing. Okay, all right. But what we want to be doing is let's go down to hematology and then let's look at the re results of the lab. So here we just have our little triangles, but you can see here that the, the triangles for hemoglobin and hematocrit show that this subject actually had anemia before they ever started drug. So when I see these, these low values before they ever start study drug, then you have to go back to this anemia and say, hmm, I'm not sure that that's an anemia. I think that may be something that was in your medical history. So by looking at these together, this would be very difficult to pick out otherwise, but by looking at these together, it allows you to sort out this kind of relationship that's very difficult to do when you're looking at individual pages by pages. So the same way with the hepatotoxicity, the, the site reported hepatotoxicity started on the same day that the study drug started, but... If we go to this study and we look at the normal range, we can see that did they have any abnormal labs? They had an abnormal alkaline phosphatase, but really all of the abnormal labs started here. So the question is, 
was this the right start date for the hepatotoxicity or in fact did that hepatotoxicity start here and if you're calling it hepatotoxicity just because of the alkaline phosphatase then in fact that they should have started before they started study drugs so again what you're doing now is you're you're stepping up your game and you're looking at things like temporal relationships you're looking at whether things should be reported as AEs or conmed I mean AEs or med history you're looking so you're looking you're doing that rectangular review right here so these fields can be defined based on the study so you it, it allows you to look at the data in a, it, depending on the specific study that you're doing okay so I'm going to switch over to Jerry now, um, and um, Jerry, I'm going to let you, please, would you give a couple of minutes of introduction about, you know, how you got here, and um, then walk through a few stop slides, and then we're going to switch over to Christine. So take it away, Jerry. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Penny says, I have been with... Um, the MANA RBM group for um, a couple of years now. Penny and I had uh, our paths cross, or meet rather, um, about five years ago um, when I was working for a CRO company. And um, so I've been in the industry for about 20 years in various clinical roles from, I started off as a clinical coordinator um, and then a clinical scientist, data manager, project manager, so I've pretty much worn um, almost every hat there is <laughs> in the industry, um, which I think, you know, really gives me a, a good understanding when I'm looking at data. Um, I, you know, I can look at, look at it from a scientific side, a medical side, as well as um, a clinical perspective. And so working with the SPAR has really been um, <laughs> revolutionary for me. Um, in my process for um, data review. Um, so for me, SPAR, um, using the SPAR, it's a supplemental tool for data, for data monitoring. Um, it, it's very um, useful in um, prioritizing data trends that may um, impact um, your data outcomes. Um, mostly because it gives you a good snapshot um, of the overall data. Um, and from a visit to visit data comparison. And as a result of that, um, you spend less time um, on individual data points, or individual visits, but rather looking um, at the study and at the data as a whole and identifying um, where there may be data errors um, or perhaps um, you know, significant data trends that um, would uh, impact either uh, your data outcomes or perhaps help you consider um, protocol protocol revisions. So, um, of course, as in any tool and any good scientist, you want to run an experiment. Um, so, to help us understand the utility of the SPAR, um, we Christine and I had conducted an experiment comparing um, the SPAR tool um, to a traditional source data review. And what we found is that it saved us 80% of the time in eCRF review, which is significant um, in, in terms of you know, what you spend, uh, what you focus your time on um, and trying to understand in, in the data. Um, and it was also fun because it didn't, you know, it didn't take up so much time. It made it easier to identify errors and dates. Um, it made, you know, obvious um, in, in terms of identifying conditions um, and differences between AEs and medical history. Um, in, in traditional source uh, data review, um, the listings and the individual data entries are um, in separate logs. Um, you don't have that immediate comparison in front of you. Um, it helps us understand and identify missing conmeds, um, which are very, which is very easy to do, as well as identify dosing errors, and most importantly, provided a synthesis of all the critical data um, values uh, for the study. Um, 
Then again, as in any good, <laughs> as in any good experience, uh, experiment, uh, what we notice is that it is a tool. Um, it's it's not at the moment. It's not um, a standalone data review. You still need to do um, some on-site review. As you know, um, the data um, the data that is entered is um, is all that you have available for you. So there are there is data at the site level um, where you that may impact. Um, you know, what AEs and CONMADs um, were taken by the patient. So, you know, you still need to be on site to do medical record review as well as pharmacy review. As, as you know, many pharmacy records are not um, entered directly into, um, into the EDC or into a source and it's held separately um, in research pharmacy. So it is really important to be able to be on site and to review those processes and review those data points. But, but Jerry, you don't have to do it quite as often. Is that, would you say that's, that's true? You don't yes. Have, yes. Um, you definitely don't need to do it as, as often as you would. Um, you know, I think right now in traditional monitoring, one would do it at every visit. Um, you know, it, with the SPAR, you're able to do it, you know, perhaps um, in the middle of study or at the end. So the timing and batching, um, of data reviews um, during visits is really um, you can use the time more efficiently because um, you've already you've already spent the time um, reviewing the individual data points using the SPAR prior to your visit. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Christine McKee um, to give you some examples of how we use the SPAR. We have you, Christine. Um, let me just see if she's here. Um, Christine, are you? I was on mute. I'm very sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Hello, everyone. Um, I had a similar experience, a uh, reaction to, uh, as Jerry did, to adding the SPAR to my clinical toolbox. Uh, when I was performing the diamond review the penny references before using the spar i would have to flip through pages or and to avoid that i started taking notes so i could compare conmed dates to ae start dates or out of range labs to aes and things like that and so once i really started to understand and appreciate the capabilities of the spar i was able to develop a flow that really improved how i monitor so one of my favorite aspects of the SPAR goes back to um, Jerry's little acronym, um, how she references it as a snapshot of the data. And in traditional monitoring, you're navigating through pages, perhaps waiting for them to load, or perhaps maybe glazing over a little bit from staring at pages that look exactly the same. Um, and the findings, uh, that I'm about to review may not be as evident when you're reviewing when you're reviewing data one visit at a time. So this first example is the one on the left shows the expected dosing for the trial day one, three, five, and seven. So great, scoot on by that. And the next one, and so all these would be on different CRFs in in different orders. You'd be looking at them in different times. And then the example on the right, right away you see either it's a dosing deviation or perhaps a data entry error because you're expecting to see a dose at day one, three, five, seven, and eight. And there's nothing at day three. So in this example, it wasn't an, a deviation, but the data, the data entry person had entered the wrong date for the dose. I was quickly able to remedy that. And um, so as you can see, the SPAR really allows you to quickly identify this. So I'm ready for the next slide. Now, <clears throat> this next slide shows an example of how, another example of how the data, an error in the data is quite evident. Now, looking at I'm looking at the AE here for a yeast infection. 
Now, you would expect the con men and the AE to be lined up with each other. And here you see monostat is lined up at day one, and the yeast infection down in the adverse events section is lined up over day eight. And so when I scoot to the next slide, Penny, I was able to drill down and see when the exact start dates were, rather than looking at them in, as in relative date. And the ConMed shows that it started on November 11th, and the adverse event is starting on November 18th. So it's just a really, it's a quick way to identify this. And when you're looking at the data, you may say, oh, okay, ComEd started in November 2011, um, 2015, that's okay. Okay, AE started in, 20, in November 2015, too. And when you're flipping through pages or trying to remember or taking notes, it doesn't jump out at you as quickly as it does when using the SPAR. And it's just a, another example of how much it really improves it efficiently like it's more efficient and more effective way for how I perform my review and it allows me to focus quickly on the data that's most important for my review and oh. that's really uh, just a couple examples of why I really like use utilizing this bar. Um, and there was one other um, point that we wanted to bring up that that SPAR has really helped us to, you know, again, to understand is if you remember from our previous um, lessons learned webinar, we talked about the importance of being able to um, revise whether tools based on the data that you found. So when we designed the original SPAR, um, we thought we included all the high risk data elements. But what our monitors found out is that they then had to go to the ECRF to check a couple of additional dates, the end of study date and certain dates for um, specific required central RN review. And so by identifying these different fields that they had to go back into the CRF to do, we were able to revise the SPAR to include these additional fields. And then that allowed the initial SPAR review to be more comprehensive. So again, if we go back to our lessons learned, you need to remember that once you design these tools, you may still have to update them based on the workflow of the team because the ultimate goal is to identify those high risk data elements and processes and make sure they're being followed correctly. So um, we're the first one to say that we never have it perfectly. We always want it's successive approximations. We're always wanting to improve and make these more usable and easy for people to um, to um to use and to make sure that we can be as comprehensive in our source data review as possible. Um, so one of the things though I wanted to do is there were some good questions that came out. So I think we have, believe it or not, this week we have a couple of minutes to do that. So I'm going to go to a question where um, that was asked by somebody. It said, your consistency checks outlined in the data validation spec will do the same checking by the CDM. So why duplicate the effort? But that's what's. But but in fact, that's not the case. So it may be that um, start and stop dates most of the time when we've. Um, it depends on who, who's designing the validations, and it also depends. In many situations, there has to be a a clinical. Um, uh, what do I want to say, clinical assessment. So in most situations, when I've talked to many data managers, the areas that we're showing here are the areas that they felt monitors did not do a good job on and that these were the responsibilities of the monitors. So if it's a day check, yes, you might do that. But if in fact, if it's whether it should be an AE or, um, or a, a med history, whether there are specific adverse events, usually those kinds of queries are done by the monitors and the expectation is the monitor is looking at things like inclusion exclusion criteria and making sure from a medical standpoint that these are correct. So in most situations, those kind of data checks cannot be implemented. Um, and again, you're wanting to look at this whole context um, as opposed to just thinking about checking dates. So check dates are a really useful piece of this. But you're really wanting to look, when you look at the SPAR, at things like, are the assessments of the, of the investigator similar to the, inve the assessments that you're getting from the, um, from the subject? So it can be a lot of different kinds of things that you look at. 
Um, so, and most of the situations, the reason we're looking at them this way is they can't be done from a data, um, a, a CDM, the data manager and in the data checks that are there. So again, everybody does things a little dif differently, but that's why that we designed the tool this way. Somebody asked, yes, these graphs, the SPAR is on an individual subject basis because remember the SPAR is being done by the site monitor who has, in our workflow, has to be the person that um, uh, looks at each individual subject. So that's why we're, we're setting those up specifically for each individual subject. And then the central monitor does the review above that. So um, one other person made a comment about raising a query for any abnormal lab is too broad. It should be done within the context of the underlying disease. Absolutely. Not every abnormal lab is necessarily, and certainly if it's just barely above the range, it's not. But I think that you have to realize that you have to think about um, abnormal labs. You can't just, the, the message here is that you can't just take whether it's clinically significant to determine if it's an adverse event. You really have to look at it, as you said, in the context of the disease, as well as the investigational brochure and the protocol. Um, uh, so one other question that came up from the team is, um, are you creating all kinds of, of graphs? Is the monitor entering data into these graphs? For instance, the SPAR. The, so the answer is yes, we, we develop a lot of different reports, but the, the tool that we have found most useful to us has been the SPAR. So although we have different kinds of reports and different kinds of tools that we use for training, for investigational product, for a lot of different areas, the SPAR is really the data that we're getting, um, all the data from the CRF, the labs, it's the synthesis. So, and that data comes from the sites um, and not none of that data is entered by the monitor. So the monitor is using it as a review tool. So I think those were the questions. So um, in summary, what we want to say here is that um, for source data review, which is what the new expectation is for monitors, is that you're going, that both source data and documents, we can't forget the documents, review includes all areas of safety, efficacy, protocol compliance, good clinical practice, and IP management. Again, these were the areas focused on from the uh, risk-based monitoring guidance. Um, a large amount of the review can take place remotely with proper design of electronic systems. And that's what we wanted to show you here is that you can do a large amount of review immediately. And that's one of the values of this is that you're not, no one is waiting for somebody to go out to a site. You can look at the data as it is. Yes, you will still have to check some things out at the site depending on your protocol, but yes, you will. But, but the vast majority can be reviewed remotely and, and you can start that review right away, which is what we're really focusing on. So tools like the SPAR are not everything that you have to do, but they help you with things like your temporal relationships, your relationships across different data sets, which are very difficult to synthesize if you can't look at that data. It allows you to do efficient review of your high risk data elements and, it, and it's an excellent first step in the review of subject data. Now, I mentioned here for both the monitor and the site, but we have a lot of site personnel that take our course. And one of the things that we've really done as we've looked at this is to think that this might also be a really good tool for the PI to really see how their subjects are doing, their, their research subjects. So although right now we're using this tool for as a monitoring tool, we also think it's a great way to allow um, principal investigators at a site to really understand what's going on with their subjects. So I want to thank everybody for your participation. And remember, we have one more webinar. All the ones from Lessons Learned and from Central Review are up on our YouTube channel. And this one will be up next week. Um, next week's webinar, which is the final in the, in the um, program, is um, about um, reviewing site performance and looking a little more at tools. Um, and the other thing that I want to emphasize here is that um, we would really appreciate any input that you want. We're eager to, to help continue to train the industry. So if you have other areas that you would like us to do webinars, 
we will probably go to trying to do a webinar once a month instead of every week um, to really help um, advance. So if there are things that you want to know more about, send me an email. Um, you guys have been great about keeping me in contact if you are going to miss a session or whatever, but we are here to help. We are here to support the industry and we are really excited um, to have had you guys as part of this presentation and look forward to getting your feedback. So thanks very much. Have a good weekend and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.